To address the challenges related to early detection of pancreatic cancer, our panelists today, Dr. Soren Brunick and Chris Sanders, use their expertise in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and natural learning to predict the risk of pancreatic cancer from real world longitudinal clinical records. Dr. Soren Brunick is research director in the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Protein Research at the University of Copenhagen. His program combines molecular level systems, biology data with analysis of healthcare sector, phenotypic <laughs> data such as electronic patient records, registry information, and biobank questionnaires to understand multimorbidities and treatment related disease correlations as temporal disease trajectories. Welcome, Soren, who is um, signing in from Italy today. Dr. Chris Sanders is from the Harvard Medical School Department of Systems Biology. He is an internationally recognized expert in computational and systems biology with recent focus on the use of artificial intelligence in biomedicine, including using artificial intelligence methods applied to trajectories of real world clinical records to develop surveillance programs for patients at high risk for aggressive cancers, including pancreatic. Chris and Soren have given me permission to refer to them by their first name and welcome Chris, who is in Boston today. So I'm going to start, Chris, with you. Um, and this first question that I'm going to ask you, I know that you and Soren have given this a lot of thought because it seems to be an underlying driver of your research. What are the benefits from your perspective of earlier identification of diseases? And if you could address or speak to patient treatment as well as economic impact on healthcare systems. So thank you very much for organizing this and thanks for your time, everybody coming on. Uh, let's like briefly say that uh, uh, Saren and I have been professional colleagues for many years and has been a, fantastic opportunity to work together on this project, which is a difficult problem. We've made some progress. Uh, also uh, important to say that this was funded in Denmark by the Novo Nordisk Foundation and the, in the US by the Stand Up to Cancer Lustgarten Foundation. This problem uh, of uh, detecting cancer early is complementary to some of the work that people have been doing in cancer research, including ourselves, uh, on advanced therapy for cancer, but the opportunity to catch cancer early is a major opportunity. And obviously the main effect of this is going to be that if you catch it cancer early, it is more easily treatable. That leads to reduced suffering of patients, potentially extension of lifespan, and uh, it may even decrease the overall cost of healthcare in particular healthcare system uh, because of the avoidance of very costly advanced treatments. And we know that therapy for advanced cancer can be extraordinarily expensive. This depends, of course, on the particular healthcare system, who is the payer, is it a unified healthcare system or not. But overall, the benefit can be substantial in any country in terms of patient welfare, extending lifespan, and reducing overall healthcare costs. And that's our hope. Thank you. Soren, is um, that the same perspective that you have coming from the European stage? Yeah, I guess uh, healthcare systems all over the, the world struggle uh, with making ends meet economically and, and in terms of productivity and so on. So uh, also in Europe, uh, we really need new um, methods to effectivize uh, healthcare to the benefit of, of the patients, but of course also society uh, healthcare system should be sustainable and i think this kind of work is trying also to make a, a contribution to that oh thank you can you walk us um sorry through your the model that you and chris developed and how it performed in predicting pancreatic cancer yeah so so this is a deep learning algorithm so it learns from data so without data no method um, so uh, what has been interesting here is that we work with diagnosis trajectories, or we also call them disease uh, trajectories, where we simply 
um, over time record all the diagnoses you uh, you um, received in, in in the healthcare system, and we have worked with with secondary care uh, data, hospital uh, data. So um, in some countries, we have um, a lot of this going far back in others, uh, less far back, but, but diagnosis data are essentially in all countries. In some countries, they might still be on paper. In a country like Denmark, uh, and, and for a person like me, the past uh, 45 years will be covered by, by, uh, by data. And, um, and, and we then also found US data where we have fairly um, a nice data that that goes back with uh, from the veterans administration. So 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 uh, the method is trying to learn the systematics in uh, the diagnosis we uh, received uh, before uh, uh, pancreatic cancer diagnosis, and of course contrast this with those who did not. Um, get uh, pancreatic cancer diagnosis. So it's sort of discriminative features the algorithm is picking up from, from the data. And, and we used uh, data from millions of, of, of people, uh, 6 million from, from Denmark and 3 million from, uh, from the US. So this is really what we call a large scale deep learning model. And when we say deep learning, it's because we have these layered systems where we can uh, filter and filter and filter the data so that it's the essential information that is coming out uh, of the method that, that has a sort of predictive value that can work as decision uh, uh, support. So when we talk about how well it performs, it's, it, it's um, something you can, you can set thresholds as, uh, as you like. I mean, we, we train uh, the algorithm to, um, uh, to make this discrimination between cases and, 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 um, and non-cases. And in our paper, we have uh, given a lot of numbers for um, how many um, uh, patients we can find if we would like to rank them and, and find the, the 1,000 patients at, at highest risk. We should also remember that ultimately we would like to predict far into the future. So we have worked with six months, 12 months, 24 months, so six months and, and 60 months and so on. And of course we are better on the shorter time scale than, than, uh, than the longer. So there are many uh, different uh, versions of the algorithms that have different performances, but um, it, it, it all worked out uh, quite nicely in, in, in my view. So can you tell us how you determined the prior diagnosis data that went into this? Um, because you were taking patients who, had, who were diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, but what diagnosis codes before that were you looking for? And are those consistent throughout um, the Denmark system and the US system? Of course. Yeah, we, we, we are essentially just taking all the diagnoses you received. So we are not sorting them in any way. We are also looking for unknown patterns. Of course, there are known uh, uh, risk factors, some new onset diabetes and, 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 and other risk factors, but here we are just taking everything. And then we let the algorithm um, pick up uh, what, what, what is useful for making a, a prediction. So, so in most healthcare systems all over the world, uh, the WHO system, uh, ICD, International Classification of, of Diseases, is used for diagnosis. And in, in Denmark, we use version 10. In the US, it's a mixture of version uh, 9 and, and, and 10. But it's sort of that kind of data that is plugged into the uh, algorithm and, 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 and used for the training um, of it. So again, you can go to any country and they will uh, most often use a version of ICD uh, to uh, record the diagnosis the patients receive. Thank you. Um, Chris, how do you perceive this work moving forward into a, a clinical setting? You know, people read about this in the paper and the popular press and they get all excited that, oh, um, AI can predict if I'm going to have pancreatic cancer. But we always know that there's a, a lag between um, 
that press release and then when it actually is is interfacing into the clinical setting and and also obviously including that more localized community centers what steps from your perspective need to be taken yeah so let me uh, uh, contrast this uh to to breast cancer and breast cancer mammograms are fairly inexpensive and they're widely available and they are used in a clinical setting and then in fact led to early detection of breast cancer and reduced mortality. For pancreatic cancer, uh, as you already pointed out, this is much more difficult and the tests are much more expensive. So the scenario uh, that Saren also just now alluded to is that we would, with a trained program, apply, for example, uh, uh, the computer program prediction using AI to say a million patients and identify a relatively small number, say 1,000, uh, that would be nominated for a surveillance program, uh, which then becomes affordable and otherwise would not be affordable for the entire population. For those, you would then do detection using a number of advanced methods. Some of them work, some of them are expensive, some of them don't work yet. For example, MRIs or endoscopic ultra ultrasound. Uh, and then there's a chance among these high-risk patients to actually detect the cancer early. This requires collaboration, number one, with people like us who are experts in artificial intelligence and data sciences, number one. Number two, people who develop these new methods of detection, like new blood tests that look at DNA uh, or look at proteins or look at uh, other bodily fluids. Uh, and then, uh, and this is work in progress going on in a number of different laboratories. And number three, it requires collaboration with clinicians who are then able to actually test this in a clinical setting, either locally in a healthcare system that can do it by decision of the institution or in a clinical trial that would have to be approved uh, by authorities. And so to move this forward into a clinical setting will take several steps. And the third, last one is actually prospective investigation in clinical trials uh, and this depends, how that's done depends on the particular healthcare system. Now, if that's possible in one location, say, for example, Denmark, or say, for example, the Veterans Administration with whom we've collaborated on this, uh, then, of course, the question is whether or not the method uh, and the procedures are adaptable from one system to another. And that's a major issue they've been thinking about. We already see differences between Denmark and the U.S., uh, between the Danish healthcare system, which is very well organized, has excellent clinical records. In the US, the Veterans Administration does have good, well-organized clinical records, but there are other issues of fragment of accuracy of healthcare records in US healthcare systems and fragmentation among different locations. So this is a non-trivial problem. From the machine learning point of view, uh, Sarah and I think that we can take a model that's well-trained and then using particular techniques for machine learning, such as transfer learning and adapt it to particular local situations. This does require collaboration with local healthcare systems, the healthcare professionals in those systems. Perhaps it might even require a commercial uh, effort. Our software is open source, and but there may be people involved to actually serve local hospitals to actually get this thing implemented. An example like that, in the open source software community is Red Hat. Linux is an open source system, but Red Hat is a company that then rolls that out and adapts it as a commercial service company to different situations. So we'll have to learn not just how to apply this in different settings, but also how to actually train the healthcare professionals in the different locations so they can productively apply this, adapt it to whatever local databases and local patient population they have. So when you're talking about that, um, it makes me think about other diverse groups, for instance, race, ethnicity, age, gender. Um, how is this algorithm need to be adapted or does it need to be adapted in order to um, have as much of a, um, a validity with, the, with other groups than just what was tested on? Yeah, <laughs> this, 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 yeah. This, this is very important with machine learning because 
it, it, it might proceed automatically, the, the, the training, but you still have to take the responsibility of being the teacher uh, so that you choose what data to show the algorithm. And if you are having uh, only sort of Caucasian patients, then of course there will be features that will not be um, present uh, so that when you work in a multi-ethnic uh, population, your algorithm will not uh, fare as, 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 as well. And we have also seen uh, some of that in our comparison uh, between uh, Denmark that has a very uh, homogeneous um, one payer uh, healthcare system to um, a system in, in, in the US that, that, that uh, has many uh, different uh, ethnicities and maybe also socioeconomic challenges um, that, that, that are different from those in, in, in the Nordic um, countries. But in our work, we have not tried to hide that. We have simply tried to benchmark. Both Chris and I, we have worked a lot on benchmarking of algorithms. So we have trained the Danish algorithms. We have benchmarked it in, in the US and, 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 and vice versa. So, so we need to understand how we should compose the data sets in a way where we uh, get similar performance in different um, uh, healthcare systems. And, and, and this is sort of a novel area in the patient and, and disease prediction uh, domain. In, in bioinformatics, we have worked on that problem for many years. How do, we, um, how, how do we become really pedagogical in the data that we show the algorithm? And, and um, I think we are in a good position to actually solve that problem also on, 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 on healthcare data, where we balance the, the data sets. We have multi um, uh, morbidity problems in, in, in the VA um, uh, cohort that is uh, higher than it is in, in, uh, in, in Denmark. How, how do we balance that out in, in, in the data set? So, so we think the algorithms are, are fine, but we need also to work more on, on balancing the data so that we are uh, getting the same performance in, in, in the two um, uh, situations. Um, of course, in the US, you move more around, for example, so there might be holes in your, uh, in your trajectory data. In, yeah. in, in Denmark, we got our, uh, we got our so, uh, social security number in 1968. And, <laughs> and that means that all healthcare events ha um, has been taxed um, uh, since the 70s with that number. So even if we move around, it still goes to the same data. So of course, we're a small country, so it's easy to romanticize that. It's a much bigger challenge in the US, uh, clearly, and other big uh, countries. But, but, but this business of, of making the data hang together so that it can be plugged into algorithms, that, that's really something all countries should work on. How can you bring your data from where you live now to another setting and then still have reasonably complete data that can be used to compute your, your risk, for example, of getting pancreatic cancer? Thank you. Um, Chris, um, I know in the methodology, you not only were working on prediction of whether cancer is likely to occur, but also to provide risk assessment and incremental time intervals what would this mean as far as frequency of observation of a patient at risk, for instance, with pancreatic cancer? So as uh, Søren already pointed out, uh, uh, part of the innovation and the way we did this machine learning to not just predict yes or no, whether or not somebody is likely to get pancreatic cancer, but are they going to get it within three months, six months, 12 months, 36 months? Uh, and this becomes a question of a design of a surveillance program. What's a surveillance program? By, by that, we mean that patients that are at very high risk in an affordable and practical way with a reasonable expectation of accuracy, about 30% for the 1,000 out of 1 million, that they're brought in for more frequent visits and for more expensive tests. Now, that's a question of personal costs and also cost of the tests. And you don't want to do it for too frequently, but frequently enough. So having prediction of the time interval 
by which the pancreatic cancer is likely to occur allows clinicians to then bring in patients more frequently or less frequently, depending on the time interval at which pancreatic cancer is predicted to occur. And we've learned this in discussions with clinicians, such as our colleagues at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, uh, who also were part of this uh, collaboration. And with their advice, it seems that the practical way to go forward to stagger the surveillance program, to be practical and cost efficient, so that people, depending on the time interval of the prediction, are brought in more or less frequently and are subject to more or less expensive tests, such like such as uh, MRI scans of the abdomen or something called endoscopic ultrasound, uh, mm -hmm. which is a way of getting closer to the pancreas and uh, even take biopsies. So it's all about designing surveillance programs in collaboration with clinicians and make them effective, cost-effective, and practical. Thank you. So um, we know that there is some of the current and future applications of AI and Soren, if you could talk about um, some of the risks and opportunities for misuse and how those may be mitigated. And likewise, how are patients' records and medical data being protected? Yeah, so there's no doubt that AI methods and, and the deep learning um, methods in particular can be um, misused. Um, and I think this has been also covered quite well in, in, in the press. I think in this domain where we predict uh, a risk of a, of a future disease, I think it, the risk is, is more in, in, uh, to be categorized as, as, as an, uh, a risk of, of uh, being used in a too naive way. And, and um, it's not really that it's, it's, it's dangerous, but if the um, algorithm is used, on a patient population, as we just talked about, where we didn't really have any training data, then it's uh, presumably not um, performing very well, and therefore it, it should not be uh, used. So, so, um, uh, so it, it, it's not really misuse. I think that is the right uh, word. But but we need to train clinicians in how to use these algorithms, and and the clinicians. Uh, you uh, need to train us. I mean, uh, Chris and I, we are not MDs, and we also need to learn from them uh, how to make the best possible data sets and, 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 and how to balance risk factors and, and so on. So it's a two-way um, uh, street, but, but misuse uh, is not really what I anticipate with this kind of, of algorithm. But of course, when we talk about the health records themselves, as you asked about, how um, should the data be protected and so on, uh, this is really uh, something that, that is under consideration all over the world and, and uh, uh, closed environments where our employees, for example, cannot take the data out and download them. Uh, closed environments that are not connected to the internet, you can log in with, with um, two-factor login and, 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 and so on. Uh, I mean, data can be protected. The banks are, for example, quite good at protecting uh, the home banking models and so on. Of course, uh, there, there are incidences, but, but it's about putting resources into um, security and, and of course also uh, training people to, to use them in, um, um, in a responsible uh, way. Uh, but, but I think these problems can be solved also for secondary use. Of course, um, primary use, that's the responsibility of the healthcare systems now. We are talking about secondary use where the data are used again to, to produce algorithms and, and that part should of course also be super secure and I think uh, this is at least the situation in, 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 in Denmark and also uh, around the Veterans Administration that, that uh, have delivered data and, and, and collaborated in this, this uh, project, very important uh, aspect. Yeah. If yeah. I could just make one, one, one footnote comment on that, uh, Barbara, if that's okay, sorry. Sure. The, uh, yeah, while there is, of course, misuse of AI, for example, social media where stuff gets generated, we know that that in this setting, uh, 
uh, the software does not replace physicians, but it's, it's decision support for clinicians. And so it's in the hands of clinicians who are trained with medical ethics uh, and they together with patients then make a decision using these tools. And that is a highly protective setting uh, supporting what Saren just said. I know you mentioned that once before when we were talking in preparation for this, that um, a, a predictive algorithm was not to be a yes, no uh, for a doctor, but it was just to be a support for his own knowledge and um, help with that um, diagnosis. So yeah, it was a good for, point yeah. you made. Yeah, or for oh. their, or, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so despite all of AI's potential and all that we read about, the use of the tool currently in clinical practice is probably in its infancy with little widespread adoption for, for now. And probably the most widely used medical device that incorporates AI is atrial fibrillation detection on the Apple Watch. What additional data collection in both the clinic and via wearable devices could be used by artificial intelligence in the future for better prediction of disease risk? I mean, I, I think there are two parts to that. One of them is uh, what data is available now and can be made available. And the other one, what can be collected in the future? Uh, it would even be great to have the existing daily data from wearable devices. You mentioned one, smartwatches, another one, for example, diabetes patients, uh, some have access to wearable devices that measure in a continuous fashion glucose, uh, glucose, especially glucose before you have breakfast called uh, fasting glucose is a very important measurement. If that starts declining, that is one risk factor for pancreatic cancer as people have researched. And so just to have the available data, uh, data from currently available wearable devices would be fantastic. They're not in databases. Uh, all the things that are done on smartwatches right now or from the glucose sensors are not available typically. So that's an organizational question in the healthcare system to make those data available. Similarly, in the US in particular, and in contradistinction to Denmark, which is much better organized, uh, we have all kinds of different healthcare systems. There is a national effort in the US called All of Us, which collects samples from uh, currently a million patients uh, similar to programs in the UK and Denmark, who are uh, one or two steps ahead. Uh, and uh, from those patients, you get the whole genome sequence, and people can opt in to, uh, to upload their clinical data from the health records to a unified, protected system that's accessible for researchers. And even though that still hasn't reached quite 1 million, I encourage people in the US to sign up for this. It's called allofus.org and actually help the, na the national situation in the US to have more integrated data and catch up with well-organized countries such as Denmark. And so that's just currently available data. In the future, of course, there are other things that could be measured uh, and uh, from new uh, wearable devices uh, or from standard practice. I mean, everybody who has a yearly uh, uh, health check typically gets a blood test. Does everybody get a urine test? No. And that's also highly informative, especially if both urine and blood, and of course other bodily fluid, if they're available, are measured to much greater depth using new molecular technologies and new kinds of biomarkers. And this is ongoing work. And that's what we hope will be highly informative to improve the kind of machine learning we can do to assess the risk of pancreatic cancer and of course also other cancers. Um, thank you for that. Um, Soren, you talked about collaboration with different countries, different healthcare systems. How do you perceive these global col collaborations being facilitated? No, I, I think um, uh, comparing data, harmonizing data across uh, countries is really something that, that is uh, important because we need for a rare relatively rare disease like pancreatic cancer, we need to bring the number of cases up in our data sets. We need to learn from as many people um, as uh, possible. So uh, bringing data from different countries together um, is, is of course a challenge. It's also a legal uh, challenge uh, 
We work, for example, with what is called federated learning, where the data stays in, in the different countries where, where they were uh, created. And then you send the algorithm um, around. So there are um, ways of, of, of dealing with the, with the legal challenges, but, but, but it needs simply to the benefit of, of um, the patients, uh, it needs to become less difficult to um, uh, to to combine data from different uh, countries because it's in nobody's interest just to to work with small uh, data set and I think that that's absolutely um, uh, essential. I mentioned the European health data space earlier, uh, where there now is a European law saying that all countries should uh, sort of prepare similar setups, and they will uh, not do that. In, in a few months, but co Corona has really also taught us how important it is to be able to act fast. And I would say that one technical challenge that I think uh, we need to, to solve um, is that, that registries and, and databases needs to become uh, accessible in real time to a higher degree. Chris just mentioned all of us where you upload data, it's a good start. But if you really want to have screening running as a sort of background process uh, on, on all your data, the, um, uh, the registries and the patient record systems needs to become available in, in, in real time. For example, the Danish patient registry, it, it was a couple of years ago, changed into a real-time registry. It was not because of Corona, the decision had been taken uh, long ago. But that kind of technical changes where it's not something we should sit with lawyers for three uh, years. Uh, of course, we should protect data, but, but the present situation where, where you need to talk more to lawyers uh, than your scientific colleagues is not um, to the benefit of the, of, of the patient. So we need to put some pres pressure on the relative, uh, the, the respective parties in order to, to get some of these issues solved. And, and we see some openings in Europe, at least. And I think in the US, you, you have good opportunities for actually sharing data across the country. And we, uh, we envy that in Europe, uh, even if we have good data in, in Europe, we are not so uh, in a good position for, for actually sharing them. Okay. Um, Chris, can you talk a little bit about your approach to prediction and the design of the surveillance programs? Can this be used with other cancers as well? I know that you focused on pancreatic in your work, but can it be used with other um, cancers? Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 answer, the answer is a clear, clear yes. Uh, and this is an intent uh, that we and others, uh, I'm sure, will pursue. There's a big distinction. On the one hand, you have breast cancer, uh, where there are existing screening mammograms, which perhaps could be improved. And there's AI methods to improve the recognition of cancer within mammograms, as you mentioned earlier. But that's already pretty much in place into the surveillance program for the broad population. For prostate cancer, similarly, you have blood tests using PSA, uh, and that's not a great test and it could be improved, but that's already population-wide, at least in many, in many, uh, in many uh, healthcare systems. On the other hand, pancreatic cancer uh, and similarly ovarian cancer uh, present late, typically in an aggressive stage, and the tests, the molecular tests, the biomarker tests, the blood tests are not anywhere close to where they should be, and that's work in progress. So in addition to pancreatic cancer, another candidate on the list is ovarian cancer, and then going down the list uh, to other cancers, colorectal cancer, which is very frequent as well. Uh, and in each cancer type, however, the situation is somewhat different in terms of what's available to the biomarkers, but what's available in terms of uh, uh, the, the information that's available to, to design a, a practical surveillance program. But overall, yes, uh, this is important for all cancer types. Beyond that, and I think Sir alluded to that, and he's worked on that for many years, there are other serious diseases where the availability of healthcare records and the ability to analyze them using advanced data sciences is important to make not just therapeutic, but also preventive recommendations to the population, including reduce smoking, do exercise, 
a better nutrition, et cetera, which we know reduces the risk of cancer as well as some other uh, advanced diseases. So in the future, with the right kind of community coming together of clinicians collaborating with uh, AI researchers, uh, disease risk and corresponding preventive and therapeutic options has potentially a great future. Thank you. Um, what are your plans for next steps with this research? Either one of you, <laughs> or both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think for, first of all, the 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 advantage of of, of entering in, into these uh, collaboration is, of course, to to produce um, algorithms that have learned from orders of magnitude uh, um, more patients than any doctor will ever see in their career. So, I mean, uh, MDs are super smart people who are really good at also correlating features um, in, 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 in what they observe with, with the patients, but they are not looking at 9 million patients as we have done in, in, as we have done in this uh, project. So I think that's the opportunity to complement what the clinicians already can, can do. They know a lot about uh, risk factors and so on. But these algorithms, they have the advantage that they might see patterns that only uh, can be picked up if you have a lot of data from, from, from a lot of, 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 uh, of patients. And this is also where your organization that uh, sort of um, uh, make a network across uh, stakeholders in this area is very important because we, we, we need you also to... to, um, to um, talk about the um, sort of liberation of, of, of data so that they can be uh, used for improving the, um, the algorithms. Um, I think that's an essential uh, aspect. And, and um, sometimes it's not so easy to get uh, projects funded across countries. Uh, sometimes uh, countries are very selfish or even uh, data protectionistic and so on. And, and we need to work against that because it's not good for society, it's not good for the patients, and it's also not good for us as scientists that we cannot you know, do the, the best possible uh, job. So I think that aspect is, 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 is very important to, to uh, yeah, just, not forget uh, that this is a, a barrier. Yeah. Yeah, could I just add one point to, to that? Uh, and. And I mean, CERN is uh, actually a pioneer in this, that, that the, uh, we want to add genetics uh, to the information. There's been lots of work on genetics. It's a genetic predisposition for cancers and pancreatic cancer in particular also. In Denmark, there's a national uh, project to sequence the genomes in the population over time. The UK has one called the UK Biobank. In the US, the All of Us program. So with the cost of reading the genetic code in people uh, called genome sequencing with that cost coming down to net cost being under $1,000 uh, um, per, per genome, uh, it will be possible to have this data available for a much larger fraction of the population. And we can then using some new AI methods and other computational methods to actually relate the inherited genetics of any person to their likelihood to get pancreatic cancer and other cancers. And this is certainly something that will take quite some time with the availability of data, but it's a important add-on to the overall risk assessment. Uh, and that's something that uh, both Saren and, 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 and we would like to, uh, like to engage in. One other aspect, if I may, and this is U US specific, in contradistinction to Denmark, and I look with envy at the quality of their data records, uh, that we have we, we have found out that the uh, some of the clinical records in some of the US healthcare systems, especially disease codes, are quite inaccurate. Now AI can slice through that reasonably well, but we need to pay attention to the accuracy of the clinical records. And we can use natural language processing to improve that situation, uh, which is caused in part by billing practices where in hospital system because of the commercial, medical system, there's lots of uh, inaccurate disease codes which are added and clinicians have told us that this is actually the case. 
So natural language processing from AI, which has been very powerful for things like chat GTP and so on, can be used to improve the accuracy of the clinical health records. Less needed in Denmark, but for sure needed in the US healthcare system. That's a painful branch of our projects that we need to engage in to improve the overall ability to learn disease risk from longitudinal healthcare records. Um, a question uh, for you about patient at the role of patient advocacy organizations. Um, how do you perceive that role for groups changing during this period of technological shift? And what more can the WPCC members do specifically to provide support? Yeah, I would say our experience uh, from, for example, implementing uh, the national genome sequencing um, program that Chris just mentioned in, in, in Denmark, I mean, if it hadn't been for the patient uh, advocacy um, uh, organizations uh, and their positive uh, vibes around that program, the politicians would never have dared uh, making that law. Uh, that, for example, also stipulates that if you accept to become sequenced at a sequence at a Danish hospital, your data will go to just one database that can be integrated with the national patient diagnosis uh, database and so on. So, so I think it's it's extremely important that this contract we have with the patients, it's it's their data. They come from their treatment procedures and 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 uh, the. The, um, uh, the, 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 the your voice in in, in sort of um, uh, stressing that you want your data to be used also to improve early detection. I think it's it's uh, super important because otherwise we would be out of uh, business. We cannot force the data out of the healthcare systems. We need to have a, a consensus and 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 we'll be working together around. Uh, liberating the data so that they can be used uh, uh, to make better detection. Okay. And maybe one additional point on that, uh, if I may, is that uh, you know I think patient advocates can be very important in a groundswell of demanding certain changes in the system. I remind you of the situation in the US with the AIDS situation where patients uh, demanded acceleration of research approval and availability of the combination therapy then, that then became available. Uh, fast forward to situation, for example, uh, in Germany, which is also very fragmented for different reasons, historical reasons among the different states uh, within Germany. Uh, they can't get the act together, not easily. But if patients speak up and there's a movement among patients and patients lobby, if that's the right word, with their governments, with their representatives, uh, uh, then that would actually be a very important way of breaking through some of those barriers. Uh, and uh, uh, scientists as well uh, can unify across uh, borders. There's an organization called the Global Alliance for Genomes and Health, GA4GH, which has worked on certain transnational projects, sharing software, looking at common problems. So I also look forward to scientists in different countries, including actually China, uh, who are quite interested, but their political barriers to advance the ability to share software and to share data, yes, behind closed walls, but in a way so that we can compare machine learning on health records across different countries and maybe even develop globally available, globally applicable models that work across different countries and then able to export those to countries that currently can't afford to do the training themselves. So um, I think what you're saying, if I am to, to summarize that is, as patient advocacy groups, we work hard to change policy. And that's something that you're talking about with this as well. And also to use um, grassroots, which um, we have globally with, with our 100 different organizations. So those are um, two good areas for us. Thank you for giving us that. Um, there's a couple questions that I'm going to raise to you right now, Chris and Soren. The first one is, what are Drs. Brunick and Sanders' thoughts on incorporating natural language processing 
in order to identify symptoms that arise that may not lead to an ICD diagnosis. And I think I mentioned this yeah, already. I, I think yeah, that, go, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Chris has already mentioned this, and, and, and we actually also have a, a paper on bioarchives on, on how to pick up symptoms from, from clinical narratives. Um, and uh, many people work on that, uh, different places in, in the world, because uh, there's no time um, at the hospitals and, and with GPs to code everything. Yeah. And, and luckily, these NLP methods can actually extract stuff in a more high throughput fashion so so we should really um, also get these uh, methods included in in in, in, in uh, what we do but again uh, tp records for example they are not so um, easy to get at uh, when it comes to the text in many countries and and uh, so there are issues again sometimes with with access to data that needs to be improved so, um, Chris, I'll give you this question. The huge amount of data collected are elaborated with a given algorithm to predict or detect as early as possible pancreatic cancer. Could they be also used by other researchers with an adapted algorithm to predict other cancer types? We kind of talked about that. Would you make the data available to them? So, so uh, uh... The data about health from healthcare records, uh, if that's uh, the question, yeah. cannot be shared. Obviously, perhaps the person meant, uh, can will we make the software available, uh, and and uh, the nuts and bolts of how we do the training, including how to train the hyperparameters, which are ways of optimizing the system once you have a certain test set, and a development set, uh, and uh, and a training set. Uh, technical questions like that. So we, yes, we make the software available that we jointly developed uh, as open source and they're available on a repository called GitHub, uh, which is a common mechanism for sharing software code. And all of the details of how we train are described in the publication. And if people would like to get more details of how we've done that, we're happy to share that. In principle, this methodology is applicable to other disease situations and other predictions. However, the devil is in the detail. You do have to adapt uh, the deep learning, as Søren pointed out, that has a, a, a neural network architecture, the way you enter the data, the way you map the data to a lower dimensional space, what's the cost function that you have to optimize to do the training, and how do you evaluate the estimated accuracy, all of those things that really have to be specific to a particular prediction problem. And it's for the community in discussion to get that right. It's not just importing the software and hitting a button. It's not quite that simple, but we're happy to help. Great, thank you. Um, another question here, do you think RCTs will need to prove overall survival benefit versus using carefully conducted observational studies such as what you have done so far. Uh, yes, I would. I would say uh, definitely yes, and 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 in other disease areas where we have produced um, similar algorithms, we actually have uh, uh, RCTs uh, running. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, in that way whether uh, receiving this score when you are with the patient will um, uh, better the outcome for those patients. Uh, and then we compare with 50% uh, of, of the patients where the score is not made, av made available to, to, to the clinicians. So this is sort of the acid test for how this uh, um, actually can, can support uh, the decisions of the uh, uh, clinicians. Uh, we, sh we should, however, remember also that, that these algorithms, we haven't talked so much about this today, that they are also able to point at new mechanistic insights in the disease. Here, we have just talked about prediction, but of course, uh, doctors and, 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 and other scientists would like to understand why do you get pancreatic cancer? And, and we can also learn something about that from these algorithms. And in our paper, we have also used these explainability methods to, to sort of just start 
uh, looking into to that, and, and and that's also an important uh, task for, for for these algorithms to to be able to tell us more about what is actually uh, causing the the um, uh, disease, uh, and not just work with associations and statistics and 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 machine learning training and so on, but but actually see whether we could get some better idea uh, about. Uh, how you actually get pancreatic cancer. Which brings me to a question for the two of you, a very quick question of, um, we're so happy that you're doing this work um, in, on behalf of the WPCC. I'm wondering how the two of you got involved in pancreatic cancer. Was there something that drew you to this disease? Yeah, I, I mean, um, we we have worked in a sort of pan cancer um, uh, fashion before, and we have published on many different cancers and see how how um, the disease trajectories uh, look like. Uh, but but I think when you look at the uh, stage at which different cancers are being detected, I mean you don't need uh, much uh, to to. I mean if you're quickly convinced. That here is an unsolved problem, uh, yeah. and 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 this is what attracts uh, all scientists that that we want to crack some of the problems that are are really hard to crack. So so I think it's it's a very attractive area from that uh, perspective, but of course also very very difficult because we are presumably not just talking about one mechanism, but maybe four different or five different method mechanisms that can bring you. Uh, into this uh, state with with, with pancreatic, pancreatic um, cancer, so um, so uh, I think it's very inspiring to to work in this domain. Yeah, maybe one quick uh, personal comment. I mean, uh, uh, a colleague of ours, a prominent scientist, uh, uh, before dying of uh, an aggressive cancer, uh, talked to one of our colleagues and said, "Drop your egos." meaning just wanting to get the best publications, drop your egos and get on with solving the problem of aggressive cancer. And, and, and that's a strong motivation for scientists to actually engage in something that hopefully in a collaboration between data scientists, lab researchers and clinicians can actually make an impact uh, yeah. on, on, on patients. And, and so that's a strong motivation. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us today and providing us with this invaluable information. Um, again, to everyone, we'll be sending out a link to the recording of this webinar within a week. And I want to just thank once again our sponsors, AstraZeneca, Ibsen, Merck, Novartis, and Novacure. And thank all of you for Zooming in today and being part of this webinar. You'll receive an email with a survey following today's session. If you could take a moment to share your feedback, it helps us to improve our webinars in the future and to determine our relevant topics as well. Thank you again, and um, hope everyone has a good day, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.